This CMS National Training Program recorded webinar provides basic information on Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, and the Health Insurance Marketplace. You should always consult the relevant statutes, regulations, and rulings for official legal guidance. This is intended as an informational resource for partners. It isn't meant for press purposes and isn't on the record. If you're a member of the press, you can email press at cms.hhs.gov. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual workshop. Our topic is Medicare Advantage plans. I'm Melissa Moreno with the CMS National Training Program, or NTP. All right, and now I want to go over today's webinar team. So I'm joined by my NTP colleague, Leslie Long, who will be providing technical assistance. And today's presenters are Sylvia Gary from our NTP team and Kelly Singleton with the Office of Program Operations and Local Engagement, or OPAL. For help with the Q&A, joining us are our subject matter experts, CMS colleagues, Melissa Flores and Teresa Zayas, also with CMS OPAL. Thank you to everyone for your support in this event. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our first presenter, Ms. Sylvia Gary. Sylvia? All right. Thank you so much, Melissa. All right. Today, we're going to talk about Medicare Advantage and other health plans. Today's module is really going to consist of four key lessons. We'll get a good understanding of an overview of the Medicare Advantage program. We'll learn more about Medicare health plans. Lesson three dives into Medicare rights, protections, and appeals under the Medicare Advantage plans. And last, we'll get a good understanding of Medicare's communication and marketing guidelines. This is helpful because it'll help you identify some concerns you might have in the fall during the open enrollment season, but also to be aware of the things that Medicare Advantage plans can and cannot do. Okay. Today's session, again, will concentrate on looking at Medicare Advantage plans and really how they work. We'll talk about who's eligible to enroll in the plans and recognize the different types of Medicare Advantage products. We'll look at other health plans, again, talk about protections and look at the marketing guidelines. Okay, lesson one, the true overview of the Medicare Advantage plans. Okay. Let's go ahead and dive into um, explaining the Medicare Advantage plans, looking at how you wanna compare and contrast them because each one is gonna be unique in how you're gonna get your coverage from them, especially the costs that you're gonna to need to consider when looking at Medicare Advantage plans. There's also eligibility requirements. And also you wanna know a little bit about when you can join a plan as well as switch a plan to find the right fit for you. Okay. Medicare Advantage plans. Again, these are Medicare Advantage plans that allow you to get a good understanding of how you can get original Medi I'm sorry, Medicare coverage. It's just another option in how you would like to get your health care coverage through the Medicare program. So again, although you are still part of the Medicare program, what's interesting to note about a Medicare Advantage plan is you're really looking at a managed care option. These are just choices in how you would like to get your coverage. Now, in a Medicare Advantage plan, you have both Medicare Parts A, hospital-based insurance, Medicare Part B, your medical insurance. Some Medicare Advantage plans even include a prescription drug coverage benefit. And it may also include some extra benefits as well. What you need to consider is that they do have a yearly maximum out-of-pocket cost. And you have to may have to go through a network. I'm gonna move the computer a little bit closer to me. I think there's some concerns about the sound here. Okay. So you may have to go to certain doctors that are in your network, which is again, um, plans that have contracted with that plan as well. So these are doctors and hospitals that you may have to go through their um, list of doctors and hospitals to go to get their coverage. What's also important about Medicare Advantage plans that you may see here is extra benefits, things that original Medicare does not offer. Those include vision, hearing, and dental services as well, things that original Medicare does not pay for. Now, how do these Medicare Advantage plans work? Again, you're still part of the Medicare program, 
which means that you're going to get the same rights and protections. When they sit down and vet these different products in the, to work with Medicare, they make sure that all of the same services and supplies are available to somebody who joins original Medicare or chooses to join a Medicare Advantage plan as well. We know that they can be charged out-of-pocket costs that are a little bit different than original Medicare. Original Medicare typically um, in a Medicare Part B claims, Medicare pays 80% of the claim and you pay 20% and or the Part B deductible. Under a Medicare Advantage plan, their cost structure may be different, which means that they may charge a copay for all doctor's office visits, um, a set dollar amount, and they may have a set dollar amount for specialists as well. So it's just a different cost structure. There could be a yearly limit on the out-of-pocket costs associated with Medicare Advantage plans. So it's going to be a little different. And you'll know more about that when you join a plan. They'll tell you, here are the cost expectations that are included. We know that you can't be charged more than original Medicare for certain services. And those include chemotherapy, dialysis, and skilled nursing facility care. So those protections are set in place. Now let's get a good understanding of the different Medicare Advantage plan products. On this chart here, as you can see in the graphic, they've divided it into five major Medicare Advantage plan products. Let's look at the first one here, HMOs. HMOs are health maintenance organizations. That's one thing we wanna look at. Then you have preferred provider organizations. You've got special needs plans. There are private fee-for-service products. And then Medicare Medical Savings Accounts, MSA plans. Let's look at the first one here. Medicare Health Maintenance Organizations, HMOs uh, for those in the know. And again, they probably the most familiar people are aware of in terms of looking at Medicare Advantage plans. So how they work is, um, and this is a, key, a set of different questions that we're going to kind of address here. They are managed care options. There is a network of providers. So the first question here says, can I get my health care from my, any doctor or health care provider or hospital? Well, under a health maintenance organization, they have a set network of physicians and doctors and providers that you can contract with with that plan. And they'll you can go to any of those in that plan's network. So the answer is no, you can't go to any um, any doctor or any health provider, you wanna make sure that it's in that plan's network. Are prescription drugs covered? Now there are HMO plans that offer prescription drug coverage. So it'd be an HMO with a prescription drug plan. And there are some that do not have prescription drug coverage. Now, if you choose to elect to be a part of an HMO plan that does not offer drug coverage, you cannot get a standalone prescription drug plan. It's the way it's set up. Oftentimes somebody has other drug coverage, but they still wanna be a part of a Medicare Advantage plan. They would join just the HMO plan only. Do I need to choose a primary care doctor? Okay, what's unique about an HMO plan is that typically you have a gatekeeper physician. That physician decides whether or not you can see a specialist or you can go to get a referral for um, a certain test. So again, working with the HMO plan, you know that, that you more than likely will have one doctor that will kind of make the decisions and you go through that process to get any specialist or, or other tests uh, ordered. Okay. Do you need a referral to see a specialist? Again, with the HMO plans, you know that they have a gatekeeper position. That primary care doctor, in most cases, will set whether or not you can see a specialist. What else do you need to know about this particular plan with an HMO product? You need to really work with the plan. Look and understand reading their network. Look at the plan's rules understand what the appeals process is, understand how you would get a determination if something wasn't covered, and just get a better understanding um, of how the plan works. And I really encourage you to look to see about the doctors, because if you're joining an HMO plan and your doctor is not on that plan, just be aware that you may have to change doctors in order to move forward um, and working with this plan. Let's look at the next one. Medicare Preferred Provider Organizations. PPO plans. Okay, same thing. First question, can I get healthcare from any doctor 
or healthcare provider or hospital. Okay, what's unique about the PPO plans is that you can go to any doctor, provider, as long as they are networked within that plan. Now, if you decide to go outside of the network, just note, more than likely you'll have to pay a higher cost. So under a preferred provider organization, you know that they'll have a network of doctors, providers, and hospitals that you can go to. But if you really have your heart set on going one particular doctor or one particular hospital, just know you can probably go to that, but you'll have to pay a higher, pay a higher cost. Are prescription drugs covered? Well, yes. In most cases, a PPO plan does offer some kind of prescription drug benefit. So again, look and see what plans are eligible in your area and see if they offer prescription drug benefit. Do I need to choose a primary care doctor? No, and let me tell you why. A PPO plan allows you to go to any doctor in that network. So if I say I wanna go to uh, orthopedic specialist because my knee has been acting up, I will not have to go to my primary care doctor to get a referral. I can just set, I'm gonna make an appointment with the doctor's office at the orthopedic office and see what's going on with my knee. So that's just kind of like that control that you have. Now that doesn't mean that you can't go to your doctor, your primary care doctor and kind of inquire, hey, should I see um, an ear, nose and throat specialist? But again, this gives you the option of kind of making the decisions on your own to pick the providers you'd like to go to within the network. Do you need a referral to see a specialist? No, not in most cases. So again, unlike the HMO plan, you have a little bit more uh, control on who you'd like to see and whether or not you need to see a specialist. All right, what do I need to know about this type of plan? Things I wanna encourage you, understand the provider network, understand the plan rules. Just double check to see what's, you know, what if your doctor's on that plan as well, um, do you need to switch doctors? Uh, understand the, the network, what hospital are you going to within that vicinity? If they have you traveling across the city versus the one down the street, things you wanna understand, especially also the appeal process that we'll talk more about later today. Okay, the next one is Medicare special needs plans. Okay, what's unique about them? Can I get my health care from any doctor or healthcare provider or hospital? Well, some special needs plans cover services outside of the network and some do, don't. So let me tell you what's going on with these. Typically, when you think of a special needs plan, they're going to cover a certain set of um, individuals. It could be somebody who has a specific disease. If they have healthcare needs, um, maybe they have limited income. So you have to really figure out if you qualify for a special need plan and if those benefits are tailored to you, the provider choices that may be open up to you and even the list of drugs that they're offering, um, you wanna find the best needs um, that serve your needs. Are prescription drug coverage uh, included? Yes, they are in a special needs plan because again, Typically, when you think of a special needs plan, you want to understand that they are tailoring your health care needs based on certain criteria. So again, if this is a special needs plan for somebody who has heart issues, they know that their formulary will cover a lot more health, maybe possibly more heart medications. Um, if you have some kind of kidney issue, again, they'll, they'll concentrate on that as well. So again, look to see if you qualify for a special needs plan based on your health care needs or even your limited income needs. Do I have to choose a primary care doctor? Typically, yes, with a special needs plan. And the reason why is that coordination of care, they wanna make sure that you've got um, the right um, setup for healthcare needs. So they, they typically work with a primary care doctor who kind of sets a plan of care with you, looks to see whether or not you need to see any specialists as well. So will you need a referral? In most cases, you will. And the reason why is that primary care doctor is really serving as somebody who's going to be the champion for you to see if you need any specialists or if you need to get certain tests run. Now, there is some criteria that is really involved when looking at special needs plans. Now, again, to be eligible to be a part of the special needs plan or those that know it as SNPs, you need to live in certain situations. Um, one could be certain institutions like a nursing home or require nursing care at home. You could qualify for a SNP. If you have both Medicare and Medicaid, they may offer um, um, a special needs plan in your area for those that are dual eligibles that have Medicare and Medicaid. 
If you have a specific severe or disabling chronic condition, we know that there are SNP plans available for you as well. And with that, this targeted um, coverage includes um, its members' special needs, including any kind of care coordination. So again, that, that network and that physician really working to make sure that you've got the right kind of healthcare needs being met. Now let's look at the next one, Medicare private fee for service plans. When these private fee for service plans were first um, launched, what was interesting about them is that they used to say they would, they would go, you could go to any doctor that worked with Medicare, any hospital that worked with Medicare, any provider that had a Medicare contract. So the question here is, can I get healthcare from any doctor, healthcare provider, or hospital? And you can go to anybody that takes Medicare approval. Um, but here's the deal. You need to make sure that that doctor accepts the plan's payment and the terms of their uh, reimbursement in order to be seen by those particular doctors. So the network of a private fee for service plan really is the, those individuals and those hospitals that really have um, any kind of uh, Medicare approval. But again, you wanna make sure that that doctor or provider is going to go ahead and accept the plan's payment um, for reimbursement. Are prescription drugs covered under a Medicare um, private fee for service plan? Sometimes, some of them offer drug coverage and some of them don't. So really look to see when you're looking at plans, um, when you are looking at the plan finder or talking to different agents, get a good understanding of whether or not they're gonna offer prescription drug coverage. Do I need to choose a primary care doctor? No, and the reason why is again, you've got a little bit more control. You can choose to see a specialist. You can choose to get um, tests run that you can ask your doctor to have certain tests run, but you don't need to have a primary care doctor. So again, you don't necessarily need to see a specialist to get referrals for certain tests or um, to see um, a different kind of doctor. Things to consider when looking at a private for service plan. Again, um, what you need to know about this plan is that you need to just to know what they're going to pay for certain services. Look to see at the in the notes of what your out of pocket costs are going to be with the private fee for service plan. If that particular product has a contract of network providers who agree to treat you, even if you've never seen them before, that's something that could be there. If you decide to go out of network. You know, um, they may decide not to treat you, um, even if you've seen them before. So again, get a good understanding of the rules of that particular product that you're getting with the private fee, private fee for service plan. Now, we also know that in a medical emergencies, doctors, hospitals, and other providers must treat you no matter what. So again, look at the private for service plan. Again, although they say they've got such a large network, I want you to know that uh, the private for service plans may even have a network of providers that they do um, offer for you as well. Let's look at Medicare medical savings accounts. All right, can I get my health care from any doctor, health care provider, or hospital? Yes, you can. Are prescription drugs covered? No, they're not. Again, this is a Medicare medical savings account, and we'll learn more about that in the next slide, but this is an opportunity for you to have money deposited into an account to help pay for your healthcare needs. Do you need to choose a primary care physician? No, you don't necessarily have to pick one. You have a little bit more control on how you'd like to spend your Medicare money in terms of how you'd like to get your healthcare coverage with the Medicare medical savings account. Do I need to see a referral for a specialist? No, you don't. Now, here's what you want to consider with a Medicare medical savings account. How they work is that plans deposit money into a special savings account, and that amount deposit varies by the different plans. You can't deposit your own money into that account, but you'll use this money to pay for health care needs. Now, any money left in your account at the end of the year can stay there and roll over for any future years uh, for health care costs. Now, if you keep your plan the following year, your plan will add any new deposits to the amount left over. What's important to know about Medicare savings accounts is that they don't charge a premium, but you must continue to maintain your Medicare Part B premium amount. And they could include coverage like extra benefits, 
dental, vision, and hearing, but you'll have to pay a premium for those services as well. So again, that money can roll over and can be used to pay for certain healthcare needs. Um, and again, you can't deposit your own money into that account. Okay. When looking at Medicare Advantage plans and to get a, to be a part of a managed care option, really think about the costs that are gonna be associated. Look at your out-of-pocket costs when deciding whether or not you'd like to join a Medicare Advantage plan. The first one you wanna look at, premiums. In order to qualify for a Medicare Advantage plan, you have to have both parts, Medicare A and B. And under Medicare A and B, you know that you may have an additional premium to join a Medicare Advantage plan. So looking at that, you'll have to calculate you have a Part B premium amount, and now you'll have to pay a Medicare Advantage premium. There's a deductible that's also included. So you'll have to pay a deductible. So when you're looking at the Medicare Advantage plans and you can get a side-by-side -side comparison on the Medicare plan finder, you can see what is my monthly premium amounts going to be and what is the annual deductible. Co-payments and co-insurance. Get a good understanding of what the plan's expectations are. What do you, what should I be paying for, for doctor's offices? What should I be paying for a referral um, to a specialist? What are my out-of-pocket costs if I'm admitted into the hospital? The cost structure is completely different than that of original Medicare. And all of it is outlined in the plan's materials. The healthcare services you get. So this is what they're kind of thinking about here. Look to see your provider network. If you know that you have high healthcare costs or you see the doctor quite a bit, get a good understanding about what services are they offering? Do they have um, the network of providers in your area? Will you have to travel to get those healthcare services um, met? So really kind of consider what you're looking at when you're getting the healthcare services that you're looking for. Okay, extra benefits and premium. Okay, sometimes when you hear about extra benefits, we know that they may offer vision, dental, and hearing, but also look to see if they're offering anything else. Maybe that plan is offering meal delivery services or gym memberships. Look to see if there's an extra cost for those particular benefits as well. Look at the yearly out-of-pocket costs. So again, the plan will tell you, here's what the annual limit of out-of-pocket costs will be. Once you reach that limit, then you know that you'll pay nothing for Part A and Part B covered services. Also, when you're joining a Medicare Advantage plan and you have Medicaid, look to see if they'll collaborate together and look to see whether or not what you pay um, in terms of out-of-pocket costs and whether or not Medicaid will come in and be the payer of last resort. So look to see if you need to find a product that includes both Medicare and Medicaid eligibility. Now, I know we've heard some of this before with IRMA, the income related monthly adjustment amount um, when looking at Medicare prescription drug coverage. So as you know, we take into consideration um, what you may be paying more for Medicare Part D coverage based on your income. So what exactly is IRMA? It's the extra amount that you'll have to pay in addition to your plan's premium. And again, this is in an effort to protect the Medicare trust fund. So again, if based on your tax return from two years prior, you may be paying for your Medicare Part D plan. Does everyone pay it? Well, about 7% of the um, Medicare population does pay it. So fewer than 5% have to pay, but we've seen some state, some statistics where it's um, five to 7%. So again, it's based on your income, so it'll be from two years prior. What if I owe IRMA and I don't wanna pay it? So when I had um, a previous career, I worked as a caseworker and what I saw a majority of people really did not wanna pay the IRMA amount. And I'll just tell you right now, there are some ramifications if you decide you don't want to pay the Part D IRMA amount. Okay, what can happen is you could be disenrolled from Medicare coverage altogether. And that means that if you decide to come back and join a prescription drug plan later, you will face a penalty for the months that you do not have prescription drug coverage because you refuse to pay the IRMA amount. So again, you can contest it, you can appeal it. Um, but again, if you refuse to pay it, you could be disenrolled from your Medicare Part D coverage. And again, where does that money go? Again, it goes back to the Medicare Trust Fund in order to keep the Medicare program alive. Um, and it just goes to the government. It does not go to the prescription drug plan. 
Let's look at the amounts for IRMA in 2023 when thinking about prescription drug coverage. So as you can see here, the slide is going to be based on your tax return from two years prior. So in 2021, if you filed an individual tax return of $97,000 or less, or a joint tax return of $194,000 or less, then you will just continue to pay your plan's premium amount. But if you make slightly more income, you're going to pay a little bit more. So let's look at the second row here. If you're $97,000 to 123000 is an individual tax return, but then 194000 to 246 in a joint tax return, then you pay your plan's premium amount plus $12.20. And as you can see, if you're filing married and separate tax returns, that too can affect you. Um, if you're making less than $97,000 or less, you'll pay the plan premium. But the range of $97,000 to less than $403,000 per year, um, you'll pay $70 plus your plan's premium amount. Now, everything can be appealed. If you work with Social Security, you can always ask for a donation to see about whether or not you can get some assistance um, and having them reevaluate whether or not you have to pay the IRMA amount. So again, work with Social Security, get a good understanding. You're going to file for a Medicare income related monthly adjustment amount, life changing event form. And again, it's because you may have a you know, this could be a windfall from two years ago. This is when you are currently working and now you've since retired. Have Social Security redetermined to see whether or not you are even eligible for the IRMA amount. Okay, who can join a Medicare Advantage plan? Okay, anybody can join the Medicare Advantage plan as long as you have both parts, Medicare A and B. You need to live in that plan service area. And the reason why is you want to make sure that that network is working for you, that maybe the, the product that services certain counties or zip codes or possibly state. So again, you need to live in that plan service area. You must be a U.S. citizen or lawfully present in the United States to qualify for a Medicare Advantage plan. And you can't be incarcerated at the time of enrollment into a Medicare Advantage product. Now. If you agree to join a Medicare Advantage plan, you need to provide the necessary information to the plan. That means, you know, give your Medicare information and you must follow the plan's rules. Now, the reason why we say that is because sometimes some people thought if I had two products, I could have one pay on one part of the claim and the other Medicare Advantage plan pay on another. Well, no, you can only belong to one plan at a time. And you need to follow the plan's rules in terms of living in that service area, making sure that if they give you a determination or if you continue to go to a provider that does not take um, in that plan's network, but yet you continue to file um, some concerns that you're not getting coverage, following the plan's rules and setting up um, whether or not you know how that plan works will really determine the success that you have in that Medicare Advantage product. So again, I encourage you to review the document that you get from the Medicare Advantage plan, understand how to do the appeals, understand how you would um, file claims and things like that. Now, to join a Medicare Advantage plan, you can always visit the Medicare website at medicare.gov and do a plan comparison. Looking at the Medicare plan finder, it allows you to really get a detailed search and finding the products that are in your area. So typing in um, your zip code, what you're looking for in terms of um, prescription drug coverage with the Medicare Advantage product or just a Medicare Advantage product, that allows you to kind of see the products in your area. It also will then set up a link for you that you can also look at that plan's website and you can even join on with them online. You can join a Medicare Advantage plan on the website. You can just click to enroll or you can also follow the link and, and to the other plan's websites for each particular one. If you found one that you like and you wanna join it, of course you can always call the plan to join directly, but you can also call 1-800-MEDICARE and they too will go through the plan finder with you and you can choose to enroll on the phone as well. I don't see this as often, but there are still paper enrollment forms. So again, a plan can send you the enrollment form. You may be working with an agent or a broker to kind of get you into the Medicare Advantage product that you want. Okay. Now there are five key um, enrollment periods when joining or switching a Medicare Advantage plan. Let's look at the first one here. The initial enrollment period. Hey, this is your very first opportunity to join a Medicare Advantage plan. 
It began, begins three months prior to the age of 65, the month that you turn 65, and three months afterwards, or when you're really first entitled to both Medicare A and B. The coverage begins the first day of the month that you're entitled to both Medicare A and B, or the first day of the month after the month that you requested enrollment, if you are after entitlement. So again, if I'm aging into the Medicare pro, um, system and I know that I want to be a part of a Medicare Advantage plan right from the beginning, you can do that. So if my birthday's in December, I can choose to enroll in November. It becomes effective December 1. Or I can choose to enroll later, but as long as within that first seven months of being eligible for Medicare during the initial enrollment period, I can join a Medicare Advantage plan. Your next opportunity to join a Medicare Advantage plan is during the open enrollment period, which is every fall between October 15th through December 7th each year. And your coverage begins January 1st of the following year. This is when you see a lot of marketing. This is when you see a lot of um, campaigns to kind of talk about the different products in your area. You'll get some information in the mail, seeing if there's any changes to the current Medicare Advantage plan that you're in. Um, if you wanna make changes, you can do that all between October 15th through December 7th and become effective January 1st. Now, your next opportunity is during the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period. And this is annually between January 1st to March 31st. If you've already enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan or if you've used the um, Medicare Advantage plan because you're newly eligible for Medicare, so again, this could be the first three months of your entitlement to Medicare Part A and B. This is your opportunity to pick a Medicare Advantage product. Or this is your chance to change plans or to disenroll and come back to original Medicare. So if I picked a plan in December and I thought, you know what, I think it's going to be great. Come January, I'm like, this is not really working with my my provider network or I've got some concerns. I want to go back to original Medicare. You can do that because during the annual Medicare Advantage open enrollment period, you have the option of going back to original Medicare or even changing those plans. Okay, now some individuals who are institutionalized, so those that are living or residing in a nursing home, we know that they are not limited to the number of elections or changes. So again, they have a little bit more uh, flexibility in getting the right Medicare Advantage plan based on their needs. So again, those that are in a nursing home or some kind of um, institution, we wanna make sure they get the right kind of coverage that they need. Okay, and lastly, the special moment periods. Okay, now there's certain situations that happen in your life. You move from one state to another. That warrants you moving into a different plan service area, which allows you to pick a Medicare Advantage plan during a special moment period. So again, you can make changes like that. The coverage begins the first day of the month after the month the plan gets your enrollment request. Another example of somebody who's seeking a special enrollment period, it could be that you are Medicare dual eligible and you wanna find the right plan based on your Medicare and Medicaid eligibility. So again, finding the right plan for you, you can do that. If your plan terminates um, enrollment, so say a plan has expanded in a certain area and they've got new enrollees, but then they decide they're no longer gonna offer Medicare coverage and the plan pulls out of an area, again, not your fault. You can get a special enrollment period to either pick a new plan or go back to original Medicare. Um, so again, another thing that I would really encourage you to kind of think is exceptional circumstances. So, you know, Working casework as benefits counselors, you may be aware that there's all sorts of stories that can kind of come about with somebody who, who gets, you know, into a Medicare Advantage plan. They're not necessarily quite sure they want to be a part of it. Use the special enrollment period, file through 1-800-MEDICARE and kind of get the best fit for you based on what, what, what happened to you outside of the Medicare's fall open enrollment period. So again, use your imagination on special enrollment periods, but again, there are some exceptional circumstances that could allow you to choose a new Medicare Advantage product. Okay, now here's some more. If you elect a Medicare Advantage plan while you're a member of a different plan, you know, during the open enrollment period, some people think, well, I have to call and cancel my plan because I'm choosing a new plan for the following year. You don't need to do that. You can 
it will automatically disenroll once your new plan gets your information and they process your enrollment process. Um, we know that there's not any delay in coverage. You go from December right into January with a new plan. Now, if you disenroll through a Medicare Advantage plan or Medicare, you will go automatically back to original Medicare. Um, so again, if you decide to disenroll um, from a Medicare Advantage plan, again, you'll go back to original Medicare model. Now, if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan and you join a separate drug plan, there's some things that need to be aware of. We know that we talked about HMO plans that offer drug coverage and HMO plans that do not offer drug coverage. So um, if you join a separate drug plan and you're already in the Medicare Advantage plan, um, that could cancel out your Medicare Advantage plan enrollment because you've chosen a separate prescription drug plan and more than likely you'll go to original Medicare at that model. So you wanna make sure that you're getting the right coverage based on what you're looking for. So get um, a good understanding whether or not you're going from Medicare Advantage plan, prescription drug coverage to another one or just a separate drug plan. If you're in a Medicare fee-for-service plan or you're in Medicare medical savings account, they do not offer drug coverage sometimes and you have to join a separate drug plan to add that drug coverage. So again, if I wanna go that private fee-for-service plan that does not offer drug coverage, I know that I need to get drug coverage or I will face a penalty if I don't have other drug coverage. So again, you could join a separate drug plan. Now, when you're disenrolling from a plan, you can always contact your current plan or you can go through 1-800-MEDICARE to kind of flag the record too, to make any disenrollments. Okay, now there is something known as default enrollment. And this allows Medicare Advantage plans to offer a seamless continuation of care that continuity of coverage if you're already enrolled in a Medicaid managed care plan and you become eligible for Medicare. So if I'm part of Medicaid, which is the state uh, program that offers uh, health benefits for those with limited income and resources, I'm part of a Medicaid managed care plan, I've aged into Medicare, so now I have both Medicare and Medicaid, then those particular Medicare Advantage plans that contract already with a managed care plan for Medicaid, they can send you right into um, a managed care plan with Medicare Advantage with Medicaid coverage. So again, you could be defaulted into that enrollment. So again, if that's the case, um, they'll get approval from CMS, they'll request it. Listen, we've got somebody who's aging into Medicare. They're already in our Medicaid managed care plan. Let's offer this continuation of coverage. That's allowed. And we, we allow them to do that with approvals every five years. Okay. Now, sometimes if states may determine if that Medicare Advantage plan can use that default enrollment. So some states may say, no, we don't allow default enrollment. They need to pick the plan that they want to be a part of. And there's no just seamless um, continuation of coverage. We'll have to pick the right Medicaid plan Medicare Advantage plan with Medicaid and Medicare um, dual eligibles. So again, look at your state to see if they even offer default enrollment. Now, if you become eligible for Medicare, what you'll get is some kind of notification, at least 60 days notice. You can opt out of that default enrollment into Medicare and you can get a special, um, special needs plan up to and including the day prior to your enrollment effective date. So again, you don't lose any kind of healthcare coverage as you transition from Medicaid to Medicare, Medicaid. So again, look in the mail. We've gotten a lot of confusion in the past where people weren't sure about how the default enrollment was going to work and whether or not they were gonna get any notification. They just figured out, oh, now I'm in the, this particular plan's Medicare, Medicaid product. I didn't pick it. How did I get into this plan? Well, there is some notification that does come out in advance to say, listen, we're transitioning you now to this company's Medicare, Medicaid product. But again, you can opt out of that as well. Now we also offer a simplified enrollment mechanism. Now this is really an enrollment process for Medicare Advantage organizations that either work with Medicare Advantage plans or non-Medicare coverage that can be used in place of a default enrollment. And what that means is they allow plans to collect information on you and enrollment information that they don't already have, especially if you're going from one product to another, and especially if you're looking at going through the uh, Medicare Medicaid process. It's available to you during your initial coverage election period, so that IEP initial enrollment period, based on your initial enrollment into Medicare. That's how the simplified enrollment mechanism could be triggered. 
is available to you and you can make sure that you've got the right um, Medicare Advantage organization that you're going to transition to. Again, no break in coverage. You'll go from non-Medicare plan to now a new Medicare Advantage plan as well. So if I had other coverage and now I would like to go and age into Medicare and choose that product, you can do that. You also could use your Medicare Advantage open enrollment period or even an SCP to change after the enrollment begins. So if you've gotten that simplified enrollment kicked in um, and now you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, but you're not quite sure that's what you want, you can always use the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period or even a possibly an SCP to kind of get the right plan for you. Okay, Medicare plans um, network changes. Okay, plans can change network from time to time. And I've seen it in the past where you've seen some doctors that you see have now left that particular plan. Well, that's okay because really you're covered with the plan and that plan has to offer you medical coverage. So this is a protection um, for you so that you don't get any interruptions in your medical care. So even if your doctor has pulled out of this particular plan, that doesn't mean you can't see any other doctor. So you still get the same medical care that you would like to have. They also have to maintain an adequate access to services. So if the network has really um, lost a lot of the certain providers in a certain key area, they have to maintain that access to them. If not, they have to kind of give you some notification that things have changed. Um, they have to give you some at least 30 days written notice that the network has changed before the termination of it all as well. I'll have to notify enrollee if their doctor has pulled out of that Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and really it's gonna be 30 days prior to the provider's contract termination. So it gives you some chance to kind of either find a new doctor, work with that current doctor to, to see who they, who they recommend to as well. Look here at the note. In most cases, network changes aren't a basis for an SEP. Now, for years people thought, well, my doctor left, so it's time for me to leave this plan but it's in the middle of the year. That doesn't mean this is an opportunity for you to take care advantage plans because really your agreement is to plan and they are to offer you health care coverage. So whether or not that doctor has pulled out, that does not mean that you will qualify for an SCP because your doctor left. They will find you another doctor. You will work with them. If they do not maintain that, there could be some um, SCPs if they don't offer an adequate coverage um, in your area, but again, that's something that you would warrant and you'd contact 1-800-MEDICARE to kind of get some more information on that as well. But again, most cases, the network changes are not basis for an SCP. All right, Melissa. Okay, thank you so much, Sylvia. It's time now for us to have a quick couple of knowledge check polls. And this first poll should be popping up on your screen. It's a true or false question. So tell me, can you only join or switch Medicare Advantage plans during two periods? Is that true or false? That is false, and that is correct because you can only join or switch Medicare Advantage plans during the five periods that Sylvia went over. You'll recall that those are the initial enrollment period or IEP, the open enrollment period or OEP, the Medicare Advantage Open Enrollment Period, or MAOEP, and Open Enrollment Period for Institutionalized Individuals, and the Special Enrollment Period, or SEP. So the correct answer is B, false. Most people enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan will continue to pay a monthly Part B premium. Is that true or false? That statement is true because if you join a Medicare Advantage plan, you must continue to pay the monthly Part B premium. The standard Part B premium for this year, 2023, is $164.90 for most people. People with higher incomes generally pay more, and there are a few plans that may pay all or part of that Part B premium for you. Some people may be eligible for Medicaid, or help from their state, like the program for people with Medicare or who have limited income and resources. So the correct answer is A, true. All right, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to our next presenter, Ms. Kelly Singleton, who's gonna walk us through lesson two. Kelly? 
Yes, good afternoon, Melissa, and thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure of discussing Lesson 2, which covers other Medicare health plans. Within Lesson 2, we're going to focus on the following. Medicare cost plans, Medicare innovation projects, which includes models, demonstrations, and pilot programs, as well as the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, otherwise known as PACE. Are you ready to learn? Great, let's begin. Other Medicare health plans. So before I say that, I want to give you an explanation of what to expect with this lesson, right? So at the end of this particular lesson, you should be able to describe other health plans that aren't Medicare Advantage plans. You should be able to explain Medicare cost plans and how they work. You should be able to describe reasonably Medicare innovation projects and our current models. And lastly, to explain PACE and its qualifications in case someone asks you, which Melissa might at the end of my session. So please be ready for that. Okay, now we can begin. Okay, other Medicare health plans. So as you see on the screen, some of the Medicare, the Medicare health plans that provide healthcare coverage aren't necessarily Medicare Advantage but they are still part of our Medicare program. Some of these plans like Medicare cost plans, Medicare innovation projects, and even the PACE plan program of all-inclusive care can and may provide Part A, which you know as hospital insurance, and or Part B, which you may know as medical insurance coverage. They can also cover Part D. These plans have some of the same rules as Medicare Advantage that Sylvia just walked through. Some of these plans are explained briefly on the next few slides. However, each type of plan has their own special rules and exceptions. I'll repeat, they have their own special rules and exceptions, which you will hear about. However, if you want to be a model student, we invite you to visit medicare.gov and you would go forward slash plan compare, or you may call 1-800-MEDICARE, available 24 days a week, 24 hours, seven days a week at 1-800-633-4227. We also have TTY availability at 1-877-486-2048 to contact any of the plans you're inter interested in and also to obtain additional information. Let's go further. Okay, let's begin with Medicare cost plans. Medicare cost plans. This has, um, <clears throat> they're operated by legal entities known and covered just now by Sylvia as Medicare maintenance organizations, AKA HMOs. And this is in accordance with the cost reimbursement contract under section 1876 of the Social Security Act, as well as under title 42, Part 417 of the Code of Federal Regulations. However, CMS is no longer accepting applications for cost plans, though cost plans may apply to expand their existing, quote, existing service areas. Cost plans uh, that are only available in certain areas, certain areas of the country, that's it. So wherever they are available, that's where the service will be provided. They aren't Medicare Advantage plans because they're authorized under a different section of the Social Security Act than Medicare Advantage plans are. Now, these plans have unique differences from other health plans. For example, they can enroll people who have Parts A and B or those who only have Part B. They can also offer, as I stated before, Medicare drug coverage. Even if the cost plans offer drug coverage, they can choose, members can choose to get drug coverage from a separate Medicare drug plan or add or drop drug coverage only at certain times. People with Medicare who enroll in a cost plan, number one, aren't restricted to using the plan's HMO network to obtain their Part A and B services. Also, they may choose to go outside of the plan's network and utilize non-HMO plan providers who then are reimbursed separately by original Medicare. 
Number two, they can join anytime the cost plan is accepting new members. They can uh, add or drop Medicare drug coverage only at certain times. They can leave anytime and return to original Medicare. So there's some flexibility there. Also, they don't have to take the cost plans drug coverage and can choose to get drug coverage from a separate Medicare drug plan, which is not the same for Medicare Advantage plans. Let's move on. We're going to now discuss Medicare innovation projects. What do they do? Let's talk about it. Medicare develops innovation models, demonstrations, and pilot projects to test as well as measure the effect of potential changes in Medicare. These projects helped us to find new ways to improve healthcare quality and to reduce costs. They usually only operate for a limited time and are for, for a specific group of people and are only off, offered in specific areas throughout the country. Examples of current models, demonstrations, and pilot projects include, as of February of this year, accountable care, realizing equity, access, and community health reach model. I've said a mouthful. We just call it an ACO. What does this particular model do? It enables CMS to test an agent HCO model that can inform the Medicare Shared Savings Program and future models by making important changes to what is called the Global and Professional Direct Contracting Model. We call it the GPDC model. And that would be effective in three areas. Number one, advancing health equity to bring the benefits of affordable care and accountable care to underserved communities. Next, to promote provider leadership and governments, governance, and last, to protect beneficiaries and the model with more participant vetting, monitoring, as well as greater, greater transparency. Very important. The Comprehensive Care for Joint Replacement model aims to improve care and to reduce costs for hip and knee replacements through episode-based payments. We have the Kidney Care Choices model, which incentivizes kidney disease prevention, encourages kidney transplantation, and offers distinct payment options to further these goals. We have the Enhancing Oncology Model, which aims to drive transformation and improve oncology care coordination by preserving and enhancing the quality of care furnished to people with Medicare under treatment for cancer while reducing spending under the Medicare fee-for-service program. We're rounded out with the primary care first model options. This is voluntary payment model options that reward value and quality through innovative payment structures and emphasizing the doctor-patient relationship supporting advanced primary care. Please ask your provider if they provide participate in these models and what it may mean for your care. For additional information about the current models, we invite you to visit our website at innovation.cms.gov forward slash innovation dash models forward slash again views equal sign models or simply call 1-800-MEDICARE at 1-800-633-4227 and we do have TTY capability at the same number 1-877-486-2048. We're going to move on now in the presentation, and we're going to discuss the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, otherwise known as PACE plans. Now, we're going to see in the first box that they have certain requirements for this particular plan. In many states, this allows people who otherwise would need a nursing home level of care to remain in their communities, which is great. However, they have to meet the conditions that will be annotated on the screen. First of all, they have to be 55 years of age or older. Second, they have to live in the service area that's being provided by the PACE organization or where the organization is offering services. That's a better way of saying it. They need to have or need nursing home level of care as certified by their particular state. And lastly, they have to be able to live safely in the community with the help 
from PACE professionals. Now, PACE covers all Medicare and Medicaid services in care and other services that the PACE team of healthcare professional decides might be necessary to improve or maintain a member's health. This includes drugs, as well as other medically necessary care, like doctor or healthcare provider visits, transportation, healthcare, hospital visits, and even nursing home stays when it is necessary. If you have Medicaid, you won't have to pay a monthly premium for this coverage, at least for the long-term care portion of the PACE benefit. If you have Medicare, but not Medicaid, however, you will be charged a monthly premium to cover the long-term care portion of the PACE benefit, as well as a premium for Medicare drug coverage. However, in PACE, there's never a deductible or co-payment for any drug, service, or care that is provided by the PACE team of the healthcare professionals. If you want information, be in the model student about the PACE program, Again, we recommend that you visit our website. You can simply go on to medicare.gov and you can look under pair, uh, plan compare and you would enter hashtag PACE to zoom right into the PACE information. And that way you can see if there's a PACE organization available that serves your community. Please um, follow me for the next slide. And we're going to go into what is called a knowledge check. You just had one. And now Melissa will walk you through yet another one. Thank you. I'll see you later on in the program. Thank you so much, Kelly. Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly or PACE is a type of Medicare Advantage plan. Is that true or false? That it's false. And that is correct because PACE isn't a Medicare Advantage plan, but it is for part of Medicare. It's a joint Medicare and Medicaid program that may be available in states that have chosen it as an optional Medicaid benefit. The qualifications for PACE vary from state to state. PACE combines medical, social, and long-term care services for frail elderly people who live in and get health care in the community. PACE provides all medically necessary services, including prescription drugs. Based on their circumstances, PACE might be a better choice for some people instead of getting care in nursing homes. So the correct answer is B, false. And now what we're going to do is go ahead and switch back to Sylvia Gary, who is going to take us through lesson three. Sylvia? Thanks so much, Melissa. All right, now we're on to lesson three, Medicare rights, protections, and appeals as they apply to Medicare Advantage plans. Okay, so after this lesson, we're gonna learn more about Medicare Advantage as well as Medigap trial rights. We'll get a good understanding of guaranteed issue, um, guaranteed rights and protections for anybody who has the Medicare program. And we'll also talk about the appeal process. Okay, let's look at here. Medicare Advantage and the Medigap trial right. Okay, sometimes when you're joining a Medicare Advantage plan, it's a little bit different than what you're used to under original Medicare with a Medigap policy. Now, Medigap policies, of course, are Medicare Advantage, um, a special policies that help fill in the gaps of what original Medicare does not pay. This Medicare supplemental insurance policy that you may have had uh, for years, and now you decide to join a Medicare plan, the two do not work together. So if you're joining um, an MA plan or even a PACE plan for the very first time, you're eligible at 65, and you say, you know what, I wanna get out of this and go back to original Medicare and buy a Medigap policy, I know that I can do that in the state by any insurance company as long as it's within the first 12 months, okay? Now, if you are joining a Medicare Advantage plan for the very first time, so say I've been in the Medicare program for five or six years, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try that Medicare Advantage plan. You can go ahead, go to a Medicare Advantage plan, but say, you know what, I don't like this anymore. I want to go back to original Medicare. You can disenroll within the first 12 months, and you can go back and buy the Medigap policy you had before, 
Now, here's the caveat. If the same insurance company you had still sells it, so that's the Medigap trial right, or you can even buy a certain Medigap plans that are sold in your state by any insurance company. So really get a good understanding of whether or not you'd like to join a Medicare Advantage plan, but you already have original Medicare with the Medigap policy. There is a trial right. You can do that within the first six months of joining a Medicare Advantage plan. If you don't like it, you can go back to it um, if they'll sell you that same policy again, but you know that you can go back and get a Medigap policy. And of course, when you're very first um, opportunity to join a Medicare Advantage plan, you can do that as well. Go in and get a Medigap policy later on. Now, remember under the Medigap open enrollment period, which is in the first six months of you joining Medicare Part A and B, that begins your Medigap open enrollment period where there's true um, open enrollment period that allows you to pick up a Medigap policy without any medical underwriting. So things to consider if you're choosing to go the Medicare Advantage plan versus the Medigap um, process. Okay. All right, guaranteed rights. Okay, when whether or not you're in original Medicare or if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, there are some guaranteed rights. You have the right to get any healthcare needs met. So getting needed healthcare services, whether you're original Medicare or Medicare Advantage plans is gonna be guaranteed. You're a guaranteed right to get information and easy to understand information whether it's in English or in other languages, that Medicare Advantage plan does have to provide some kind of documentation for you to get the information that you need in the language that you needed um, so that you can get a good understanding of what you enrolled into. You have the right to have your personal medical information kept private. So again, um, that parameters are set in place by the Medicare Advantage plan to make sure that you're getting the right um, protections if they somehow release your healthcare data to another company or a third-party entity. We know that you have the right to have that information kept um, and that there has to be some kind of resolution from the plan. Okay, rights in Medicare health plans. Well, you have the right to choose the healthcare providers within the plan. So remember I talked about the network of plans. So in the network, you have doctors, whether they are primary care physicians, specialists like podiatrists, um, heart specialists, you have the right to get the providers within the plan. They don't just assign you a doctor. You can choose to pick the one that's the right fit for you. You also get a treatment plan from your doctor. So you should have a good understanding of what your plan of care will be to treat any kind of concerns you might have. So get an understanding that I have a doctor and that they're going to work with me to set up a treatment plan for me. I also have the right to know how those doctors are paid so that there's not any balance billing and that I know that with the plan, I know that these certain claims will be paid before by the plan. I know that they're going to be paid. That I'm not going to come to the second person that has to pay it based um, in an effort to do some sort of um, cost structure or um, not provide any kind of balance billing. You also have the right to request an appeal to resolve any differences within your plan. These appeals could be a coverage determination if you want a certain test and the plan is not going to cover it, you know you can appeal it. If you have a prescription drug that is not on the formulary, you have the right to appeal it. So you can be working within your plan. You also have the right to file a complaint. You can file a grievance to say, listen, I don't like the way this plan is, is followed up on my uh, referral request, or I, uh, you know, I've got some concerns about how I was enrolled in this particular plan. You have the right to get a coverage decision, meaning I have filed an appeal. I would like the organization to determine whether or not they will cover this test or cover this medication. You're allowed to get that information in writing from your plan to say, whether or not they rule in your favor, what are the next steps to appeal the next step? And again, you have the right to have a privacy of your personal health information kept within your own personal health uh, record as well. So again, you have those rights under a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, there are also some appeals in Medicare Advantage plans and other health plans as well. Now, if you file an appeal, you know that the plan has to tell you in writing 
what to do um, and what their determination is going to be. So the, the appeal could be that they didn't pay for an item or a service that was not met. Um, they don't allow that item or service on their plan. Or if they stop or reduce the course of treatment for any particular concern that you might be addressing, um, you can appeal that decision. Now, you or your doctor who could be the champion for you can file the appeal and you can either call it in or submit it in writing to the plan. And the plan may not charge a fee. Um, I'm sorry, they can charge a fee for a mail. Um, if you mail a copy of your file to them. So again, something to be aware of, if you have to sub submit some documentations, the plan may charge you a fee. Um, if you need a copy of your file in order to send it and in, send information in. Sometimes maybe even the doctor office may charge you for a fee of medical records as well. You also can ask for an expedited uh, decision, meaning that um, based on it being a life-threatening condition, you can ask for ex a fast decision within 24 hours for Medicare Part B, uh, those are medical insurance drugs, or 72 hours of other items and services as well. So we've got two tracks on the appeal process. You've got a standard process, and then you have an expedited process as well. Okay, the Medicare Advantage appeals process is really gonna be determined by two different avenues, a standard process and the expedited process. And the first level is going to be the organization determination. So working with my plans information that I got, reading my materials and it says, I can file an appeal or I can ask for them to cover something for me, that is either going to be a decision that's issued within 14 days the plan has to say in the standard process whether or not they're going to cover a service. Um, if you have questions about a payment being denied, um, the decision has to be issued within 60 days. If it's a Part B drug decision process, they need to give you a determination within 72 hours. Now, let's look at the expedited process. If it's a pre-service decision and needs to be with an, an issue has to be decided by um, 72 hours especially with the Part B drug medication that you need under Part B coverage, that needs to happen within 24 hours. So this is known as the organization determination. You have filed with the plan to say, I need these going to be covered. If they rule in your favor, great, you can move on and that coverage becomes effective for you. If not, now you're really starting the appeal process. Okay, the first level. This is again, reconsideration with the plan. So under the health plan reconsideration at this point now, you need to really pay attention to the timeframes associated with this. And you have to follow with them. If not, it could really throw the appeal process off. So let's look at the standard process under first level of the appeals. Okay, I really want the plan to again, re reconsider my need to have this particular service. Well, they'll have to give you a decision within 30 days. If it's a payment being still disputed, they have to give you an answer within 60 days. And if it's a prescription drug coverage uh, effort with Medicare Part B claims, it has to be within seven days. Let's look at the uh, expedited process. I'm really asking that health plan to say, you know what, I really need you to look at this. I really want these um, determinations. They're, it's life-threatening. It's really gonna impact my health. Under the expedited process, they have to give you a determination within 72 hours. Okay, if everything's in your favor, great, you're, you're done, the appeal process over is over for you. If it's not in your favor, you go to the next level, which is an independent review entity. So now somebody else is gonna look at your claim and they're gonna say, okay, uh, let's go ahead, get the information. Let's see whether or not we're gonna reconsider for the beneficiary or if it's gonna be for the plan. This independent group will now evaluate and they have, again, certain timeframes. So under the standard process, again, within 30 days, decisions within 60 days of looking at payment options and Part B drugs, you're looking at seven days. Under the expedited process, they have 72 hours to make a decision. What happens if it's in your favor? Great, it's for you and for you only. And they've determined that this is for you. If not, you go to the third level. And the third level is now working with the Office of Medicare Hearing and Appeals. 
Okay. So the Medicare Hearing and Appeals Office is now going to evaluate. You've made it to the third level of the appeal process. There is no statutory time for processing this. They will make the decision. But what's important to note here is there is a dollar amount in order for them to really evaluate that. So again, it's gotta be more than $180 in dispute if that's the claim. Um, but again, the Medicare Hearing and Appeals Office will go ahead and process the next level. Again, if it's in your favor, wonderful, the, the process is ended. If not, you need to go on to the next level, level four. Now, the Medicare Appeals Council will then determine, again, there's no statutory time limit for processing this as well. They have 60 days to file and give you a determination in that time frame. So again, looking at the two of these, uh, the last two steps, you know, it takes up to 60 days for them to make a decision. In your favor, great. If not, we go to the final level of the Medicare appeals process, and that's federal district court. And at this point now, there is going to be a dollar amount associated. They will not see anything um, less than $1,850 in claims disputes. So again, really pay attention to the timeframes associated as you navigate, really think of it as a pyramid of the appeals process. You start down at first level working with really your organization, and then it goes on to other entities that kind of look at that. If you miss the timeframes on the appeal process, it could delay it or you'll have to start all over. So just be aware of that, of the appeals process in that case. All right, Melissa. Oh, Kelly, I'm sorry. Me, Silva. Sylvia, huh? thank you. Okay, so good afternoon again, everyone. I am now going to take you on an adventure through Medicare Communications and Marketing Guidelines, MCMG. You see the people walking there? Well, we're going to do the same. We're going to virtually walk through this particular portion of the training. I need you all to put on your thinking caps, your listening ears to perk up, maybe grab a cup of coffee or tea and walk with me. I am covering several slides, so I'm going to need your utmost attention. And then I guarantee and promise you that you will pass the wuzzle at the end of my presentation. Fair enough? Okay, let's get started. We are going to... You can leave it there. Uh, we are going to walk through the following. Let me just give you an overview first, all right? This particular lesson is designed to provide information on the following. Communication and marketing materials, marketing reminders, disclosure of plan information for new and renewing members or returning members, nominal gift reminders, unsolicited enrollee contact, cross-selling prohibition, scope of appointment reminders, promotional activity reminders, educational events, marketing and sales events, licensure appointment and termination of agents and brokers, agent broker training and testing, and we will round it out with a discussion regarding rewards and incentives. Why do you think you need to know this? Because this governs the way information is received, and is shown, displayed, and explained to the public. This is why this is an important topic. So at the end of this lesson, you will be able to correctly describe how to access current Medicare communications and marketing guidelines for Medicare Advantage plans. You will be able to reasonably explain the guidelines for using star ratings from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and plan marketing materials. You will be able to explain other guidelines for marketing materials and events. Somebody's crying. Don't cry. It's going to be okay. <laughs> You'll be able to explain the guidelines for licensure, appointments, and termination of agent and brokers. And that will only be when they are doing things that are corrupt. And we, you'll be able to explain the guidelines for marketing, rewards, and incentives. So with that, let's get started on our adventure. Okay, so we're gonna walk through the animation. As follows. Okay, 
marketing and communication materials. The Medicare marketing guidance communication as activities, communications as activities and the use of materials to provide information to current and prospective enrollees. That's what it's designed to do and that's what we internally use it for. This guidance defines marketing as a subset of communications. Marketing often includes activities and the use of communication, as I just stated, materials by the health plan or drug plan or their agents and brokers with the intent to, enjoy, to draw a person's attention to a particular Medicare plan or plans. Also to influence their decision-making process when selecting a plan for enrollment or deciding to stay enrolled in a plan, retention-based marketing. Marketing also includes content of the plan's benefit structure, their premiums, their cost sharing. It also includes measuring or ranking standards like star ratings or plan comparisons, or even rewards and incentives, which I mentioned we will cover shortly. Now, CMS requires that all marketing materials, election forms, and certain designated communication materials be, that are used by the plans including those used by their third party and downstream entities, as I mentioned, agent brokers and so forth, be submitted to us at CMS for review. This is under our federal regulations found at 42 CFR 422.2261, the letter A, and also section 423.2261, letter A. Although certain materials aren't subject to the review and approval process, plans must maintain these materials and make them available at our request. Medicare health and drug plans must use standardized marketing material language and formatting without modification. The exception is where we specify it at CMS. Examples of standardized documentation includes, but isn't limited to, number one, the plan's what is called ANOC, which is the Annual Notice of Coverage. The plan sends an ANOC each fall. CMS encourages members to review this document. Some people put it to the side. That's not a document to put to the side and ignore. Why? Because it includes any changes in the plan's coverage, cost, and more that will be effective as of the following January 1st. So that's why they need to be prepared in advance of what to expect and not call 1-800-MEDICARE and say they didn't know. Sometimes you don't, but most of the time this document is sent out because it has to be. Next is the evidence of coverage document. Now, this is more voluminous than the ANOC. This is about a 60 page document and um, it goes into full detail about what the plan is going to cover uh, under your membership. So the plan is required to send it every fall so around about September, people will start to receive these documents. And as stated, it gives details about what the plan will cover, how much the people will pay, and additional information about appeals and so forth, as Sylvia just explained to you. That has to be covered in the EOC, Evidence of Coverage. CMS also creates model communication materials like provider and pharmacy directories, if you're interested in taking a look at a sample of what it looks like, you can visit our uh, headquarters page, which would be cms.gov. You can click in under Medicare. Once you get to Medicare, you click under health plans. Once you get to health plans, you would then click under managed care marketing. And under there, you will see sample documentation and de directories and such. So you'll know what to expect. And if you or someone you're helping is receiving, will be receiving these documents, you'll know how to help them and tell them what to pay attention to and to read within the documentation. So for additional information, again, you would visit cms.gov at the website I just mentioned, and also see the resources slide at the end of this presentation for the link to the Medicare communications and marketing guidelines. And I'll highlight that uh, towards the end. Now we're going to discuss marketing reminders. Okay, I mentioned that during the fall, this documentation will be sent to the public or to Medicare beneficiaries. Marketing for the upcoming plan year may not, however, occur 
before October the 1st. They can prepare, plans can prepare their marketing materials. That's why I mentioned the September timeframe because that's when they're working with us. I'm an account manager. So myself and my colleagues are working with plans to make sure that the information that they're including in their documentation is accurate, but they can't market to anybody until October 1st. That starts the clock. Plans must stop current year marketing activities to existing people with Medicare once they begin marketing their plan benefits for the new contract year. So in this instance, it will be for coverage year of 2024. I'm going to repeat that because I can guarantee you that somebody, you're going to see ads before October 1st. And if you do, it's not supposed to be happening. Again, plans must stop their current year marketing to existing people with Medicare once they begin marketing plan benefits for the new contract year, and they can't do it before October the 1st. You heard it here first. Now, special note, plans may market to individuals who are eligible for a valid enrollment period, though. These might be people who are turning age 65, they're maybe considering retirement, and they're leaving the employer group coverage, for instance, or their spouse's employer group coverage because the spouse is retiring and now they qualify for what is called a special enrollment period. So they can market to them, but they're existing members and they have to have, to have that information in order to make a determination about their coverage. Moving forward, Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Advantage plans with Part D, AKA drug coverage, and Medicare Part D drug coverage are assigned what are called star ratings from us each year in CMS. Now, many individual performance measurements are utilized to determine the plan's overall star rating by CMS. When referencing a plan star ratings within our marketing materials, number one, the individual star rating measures must also include references to the plan's highest rating. I repeat, their highest rating, their overall rating. This is the Medicare Advantage plan with drug coverage. It's Part C summary rating, which is for their Medicare Advantage component, or it's Part D summary rating, which is for the standalone Part D plans with equal or greater prominence. Plans that are assigned a low performance LPI, it's called a low performance icon. We use a lot of acronyms at CMS. Please forgive us. But in any event, plans that are assigned a low PI. LPI may not try to refute or discredit their LPI status by showcasing a higher overall star rating on another contract or specific measure of star ratings. Several plans, that, uh, many of the plans, most of our plans have several different contracts. And so we rate the contract. So one of the contracts might have a low star rating and one might have a high one. So what this is stating, or what we're stating here is that they cannot uh, differentiate. Any communications in reference to the LPI status must state what the status means. Special note here, a contract that gets less than three stars for Part C or Part D on its summary rating for at least three years in a row will be marked with the LPI on our website, not the CMS.gov, but our other one for members, which is Medicare.gov under plan compare. And people will likely stay away from that plan. So it's in the plan's best interest to not uh, get three stars three years in a row. It's in their best interest to raise them up and do so quickly. So the source of this communication would be found on our CMS.gov website. And again, I'll cover uh, this during the uh, overview of the appendices. I just wanted to give you an overview of the ratings. We're going to move along now. And we're going to discuss the, the disclosure of plan information for new and returning members. Okay, listen up. Now, in order to ensure that enrollees get comprehensive plan information regarding their health care options, plans require Medicare Advantage, CMS requires Medicare Advantage plans and Part D plans to disclose certain plan information both at the time of enrollment and at least annually. This is what the notification of availability of electronic materials and so forth are pertaining to. 
Regulations are found at 42 CFR and is at section 422.2267 under section D as in David, number two, and the letter I, as well as under 423.2267, section D, number two, letter I. So when you're looking for regulations related to Medicare Advantage, 422, section 422, rather, under the federal regulations, covers Medicare Advantage. If you want to investigate information about Part D, section 423 is where you would go. All the sections under 423 pertaining to Part D. And this is notification of availability of electronic materials. This drives the guidance for that. So without prior beneficiary notification, health and drug plans may send new and current, for example, not prospective enrollees, a notice or notices, right? Informing them how to view the CMS required materials listed um, that I'm going to discuss with you now instead of receiving copies by mail. So people would actually have to opt to receive the evidence of coverage document, the provider, the, the pharmacy di directory, the provider doc directory, and the formulary, okay? Plans must also tell them how to request a hard copy just in case, because some people don't like to use the internet, believe it or not. Some people like to have hard copies in their hands, and that's okay too. Now, these notices must be sent in time for an enrollee to receive them by the October 15th deadline of each year, but again, no earlier than, well, this time, in this instance, September the 1st. So again, the documentation would be the evidence of coverage document, the pharmacy directory for all plans offering a Part D benefit, the provider directory for all plans, except obviously Part D plans, right? the formulary for all plans that are offering a Part D benefit because people need to know what medications are covered. So I'm gonna stop here, let you kind of think about that for a second. And now we're gonna move on. Disclosure of plan information for new and renewing members continued, okay? So I mentioned the regulations, always starts with 42 CFR section 4.22 is for Medicare Advantage, 423 for Part D. In this particular instance, we are referring to the electronic delivery of required materials continuing from the prior slide. Okay, so electronic delivery of required materials with prior enrollee consent consists of that annual notice of change document I mentioned to you earlier, the annual notice of change document, and the evidence of coverage errata. And errata is where there are changes to the plan's um, structure, payment structure, co-payment or deductibles, whatever, or maybe they left out something regarding a new benefit and they let us know and then they have to submit uh, a revised document. So that is what is called an errata. And then also enrollment and disenrollment notices, all right? They can be delivered electronically with consent from an enrollee, i.e. a member. They can, plans can provide any required materials or content in different media types. So that could be hard copy, it could be email, by way of their web portal, by way of a CD or DVD. Again, plans must obtain consent previously from the enrollee or member prior to doing so. And they must specify both the media type and the specific materials available. They must provide a way for their members to opt out of receiving hard copies, and they must ensure that other listed criteria are met. So let me give you some examples of required materials that are included. Number one, the standardized annual notice of coverage. Again, this must be sent to uh, members and it must be received no later than September 30th. It's posted, it must be posted to the plan's website though, by the deadline of October the 15th. I'll repeat, the annual notice of change, the standardized version must be received by members by September the 30th and posted to their plans website by October the 15th. The annual notice of change document, as well as the evidence of coverage errata, which describes the errors, as I mentioned, found in earlier versions of either document, the enrollment and dis disenrollment notifications as indicated on the screen. 
plans are expected to provide required documents for their new enrollees no later than 10, count 10 calendar days after receiving CMS's confirmation of enrollment or by the last day of the month before the effective date, whichever is later. I'm going to repeat that, super important. Plans are expected to provide required documents for their new members no later than 10 calendar days after receiving confirmation of enrollment from us or by the last day of the month before the effective date, whichever is later. Okay, let you think about that for a second and we're going to move on. Nominal gift reminders. Plans can offer nominal gifts to their potential enrollees for marketing purposes. You might have thought they couldn't, but they can. But there are some requirements around there, so let's talk about it. These plans can offer nominal gifts to potential enrollees for marketing purposes as long as the gift is given regardless of whether they enroll with them or not and without discrimination. So they can't cherry pick members. CMS currently defines nominal value within the marketing communications guidelines under section 40.4. You want to write that down, section 40.4 of the marketing guidelines as an individual item or service that is worth $15 or less. $15 or less, no more than that. When we hear about it, it's going to be big trouble, trust me. And this is based on the retail value of the item. There's a maximum aggregate of $75 per person, but that's throughout the year. So that means that once the end of that, that year ends, they could not have given a particular person more than $75 in gifts. Nominal gifts may not be in the form of cash. We're not giving away cash for joining. Or other monetary rebates, even if their worth is $15 or less. You're going to hear a lot about gift cards, you know, visa cards and so forth. And that will immediately be reported uh, to our office for investigation. Okay, there are some advisory opinions on gift cards and so forth. And that is handled by uh, the Office of Inspector General on their website. I'm happy to provide that website for you under the appendix sec section, but since I am talking about it, uh, you can log on to oig.hhs.gov and you would go under their compliance section. It has a lot of great information on how they oversee compliance. And if you look under advisory-opinions under index, they, that will let you know these are prosecutors now. They will let you know what they think about the utilization of gift cards, okay? But if we find out about it and it's more than $15, big trouble, not a good deal for the plans, okay? Let's move forward. Okay, unsolicited enrollee contact. Now, I've encountered this recently, wasn't happy about it, felt like my particular plan that I managed should have known better, but I understand the quest for marketing and obtaining new members, but it has to be done correctly. So let's talk about it. You'll see two boxes on your screen, or you're going to see them. One is regarding allowed unsolicited marketing activities, two things that we allow, and three things that we don't, indicated by an X. Medicare health and drug plans may make unsolicited direct contact with potential enrollees using the following methods. They can use conventional mail, which you're gonna hear a lot about that soon. There'll be a lot of mail, a barrage of mail coming out, join our plan and here's information about our plan. Or they can use other print uh, media like advertisements. You might be walking down the street and you might see advertisements along a bus, for instance, or direct mail, okay? They can also use email, provided that all emails contain an opt-out function because people might not like, like them emailing them about this, right? So they have to include an opt-out function. Plans may do the following. They can make outbound calls to existing members to conduct normal business related to the enrollment in their plan, i.e. making sure that they are still pleased and satisfied with the plan services and benefits, or if they need to move to another component of coverage within the plan, under the plan, they might want to discuss that. But nothing outside of that, no pressuring. 
Next, they can call people with Medicare who submit enrollment applications to conduct business related to the enrollment. And that does not mean forcing people to sign on the dotted line or to leave their current coverage. It just means to discuss the enrollment application and its potential implications. They can call former members after the disenrollment effective date to conduct a disenrollment survey. And this would be for quality improvement purposes on the plan's part. So they're allowed to do that. Under limited circumstances though, with our approval at CMS, they can call LIS, low-income subsidy eligible enrollees or members who are being assigned to encourage them to remain in their current plan. It could be reasons for that. Like, you know, the, the doctors that they're seeing are all under this plan's um, network. Uh, the pharmacies or even the medications that they're taking for management of their condition are all available under the plan. So that's a good way, I guess, to notify people who are high risk of um, their coverage for the upcoming year. Okay, They can contact people with Medicare who have given permission for a plan or sales agent to contact them, like completing a business reply card. This is where things get tricky because they have to, the sales agent has to stay with the script. The plan provides the script for the sales agent. They're also sent to training. We'll talk a bit, we'll discuss training in a minute. So you have to stick to what is being told and not go outside of the script. And he also can go ahead and proceed with processing an enrollment application without consent of the member. And I've seen that happen a lot. Also, they can make return phone calls or messages with enrollees or members as these aren't considered like unsolicited contacts. Okay. Here's what health plans cannot do and drug plans cannot do. They cannot use door-to-door -door solicitation, including leaving information such as a leaflet or a flyer at a residence. They can't do that. They can approach potential members in common areas like parking lots, malls, hallways, lobbies, sidewalks. Sounds kind of scary, right? Like a person might be being stalked or something. Not allowed. They cannot use telephonic solicitation, including text messaging, that's kind of scary too, or leaving electronic voicemail messages. Can't do it because if the member calls into 1-800-MEDICARE, official complaint is filed against the plan, that can mean huge trouble for that plan. We take it very seriously how our members are treated and how marketing is conducted during open enrollment and the annual enrollment period. Note, agents and brokers who have a pre-scheduled appointment with a potential member who's a quote-unquote no-show may leave information at that potential person's residence. Okay, so that's the caveat there. Next, we're going to discuss cross-selling prohibition. We're going to continue with the check marks and the X's. Check marks are a go and the X's are a no. People with Medicare already face difficult decisions. This is not an easy program to understand. I'm sure you all are saying that and you agree with me. You're nodding your head right now, right? So now regarding their coverage options, what they should do, um, they should be able to have the time to focus, receive the information, digest it, even do a cost benefit analysis with a loved one to find out what is the best option for them without confusion. Plans shouldn't simply imply that the health and the non-health products that they're offering are packaged. Plans may sell non-health related products on an inbound call when a person with Medicare requests that information on that non-health related product, but not outside of it. Marketing to current plan members of non-Medicare Advantage covered healthcare products and or non-healthcare products is subject to HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act rules, okay? Marketing healthcare related products such as like um, annuities or life insurance, for example, to prospective enrollees during, during any Medicare Advantage plan or Medicare Part D coverage sales activity or presentation even like say at a diner is considered cross-selling and it's prohibited. It's under the X, so it's a no. Okay, so let you all think about that for a second. Take in the, take in the go for the check and take out, check out the no's for the X. 
And now let's move on. Okay, scope of appointment reminders. Here's where the either plan rep or the agent broker visits people's homes. All right, so let's, let's walk through this for a minute. You're gonna see boxes appear on the screen. Now, the Medicare uh, Communications and Marketing Guidelines requires marketing representatives to clearly identify the types of products they will discuss before marketing to a potential enrollee or member. Marketing representatives who initially meet with the person with Medicare to discuss specific lines of planned business, let's say separate lines of business, including Medicare Advantage plans, Part D plans, and cost plans, right? They must tell the person with Medicare about all products they will discuss before the appointment. I repeat, before the appointment takes place. Why? So that they have accurate information. The member, the proposed member, has accurate information to make an informed decision about their Medicare coverage choices without pressure. I repeat, without pressure. No strings attached. Before a telephone or in-home marketing appointment, the person with Medicare must agree to the scope of appointment, appointment, the scope of appointment parameters and documentation, all right, are required for all one-on-one -on -one appointments, regardless of the venue. So it could be at a person's home, it might be over the telephone, okay, regardless of the venue. The plan can document the scope of the appointment in writing or through a telephonic recording. Organizations may not, however, discuss additional products unless the person with Medicare specifically requests that information. In addition, or moreover, any additional lines of business that aren't identified before the in-home appointment will require a separate scope of appointment authorization form to be completed and or recorded. That's only fair to the prospective member. They have enough, as I stated before, to consider, and they don't need to be confused, and they certainly don't need to be pressured. I'm sure you all agree. Products that aren't health related may not be discussed as mentioned before. No to annuities, no to life insurance. Okay, let's continue. Hope you all are right out there. A lot of information, but I believe that you're, you're getting it. You're going to pass your exam at the end of this section. Promotional activity reminders. We're going to see the bullet points Populate. All right, let's talk about it. Prospective enrollees may not be given meals or have meals subsidized at sales and marketing events. I know that the way to the heart is through the stomach, but not in this instance. Medicare health and drug plans may not give prospective enrollees meals. They can't subsidize their meals and treat them to a, 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 a diner lunch at sales events or at a me or any meeting at which they discuss plan benefits and or distribute plan materials. Used to be a time when they were doing that. Those times are over. <laughs> Agents and or sales brokers are allowed to provide refreshments though, as well as some light snacks to prospective enrollees. You'd be kind and offer refreshments, right? But plans must use their best judgment on the appropriateness of the food products they provide and must ensure that items they provide couldn't be reasonably considered a meal, like steak and potatoes and a glass of red wine, and or that they aren't bundling and providing multiple items as if they are a meal. As with all marketing regulations and guidelines, it's the responsibility of the plan to monitor the actions of all agents selling their products and selling their plans, and they must take proactive steps to enforce this prohibition. Why? Because we're watching. And not only are we watching, but I mentioned to you the Office of Inspector, Inspector General, they're watching too. And also the state is watching, okay? Because the state regulates insurance. So it's in the plan's best interest to enforce prohibition. CMS conducts oversight responsibilities to verify that the plans and the agents are complying with this provision. But again, also are our colleagues from the OIG and also are our colleagues from the state. CMS can take enforcement actions as needed and we have done so, but we don't like to be provoked. Next slide, please. Educational events. So we're going to talk about the before, 
the during, and the after, the three phases, okay? Educational events are designed to inform people with Medicare about Medicare Advantage plans, Part B plans, or other Medicare programs that we've previously discussed. So educational events uh, must do the following, or must cover the following. They must be explicitly advertised as educational. That's the before piece. The during piece, they may set up, a, a, the plan may set up a marketing appointment and distribute business cards and contact information for people with Medicare to initiate contact. This may include completing and collecting what is called a scope of appointment form. Okay, that's the during component. The plan must not include marketing or sales activities or the distribution of marketing materials, materials or enrollment, enrollment forms during the uh, educational event. So this is the during piece. Plans may, however, conduct marketing and sales events immediately following an educational event in the same general location, like for instance, if they're at a hotel. So that's the after component. For additional information on these particular guidelines, again, you can visit our website under medicare.gov and you would go in under files, you would find document, and then you would find our Medicare communications and marketing guidelines. And the date on that, the finalization date is March the 16th of 2022. I forgot to mention that to you earlier. Again, we'll cover this during the appendix uh, portion of the presentation. So next we will cover marketing and sales events. All right, we're going to discuss drug and health plans. Drug and health plans must submit talking points and presentations to us at CMS prior to their use including those that are going to be used by their agents and brokers, because we need to know what they're saying to our beneficiaries, okay? These events are actually designed to steer or to attempt to steer potential members in a particular direction anyway, right? So, you know, we have to uh, exercise extreme caution, if you will, right? And prevention. Sometimes these events are used to retain current employees or towards a plant, to, you know, to toward the plan or toward a set of plans, if you will, right? The following requirements apply to marketing events and sales events. The health and drug plans must, again, not only submit talking points to us or those of their agents and their brokers, but they can't require their attendees to provide contact information as a prerequisite for attending an event. They must utilize sign-in sheets and they have to be clearly labeled as optional. They can't force anybody to sign their sheets. They have to have health screenings and other activities that may be perceived or may be used as cherry picking. You want to see who's healthy. And then so you want to recruit them. You want to leave people who are not so healthy in the corner. Not permitted. Can't cherry pick. Contact information provided for raffles or drawings may only be used for that purpose, not for marketing. So we can't be what the, what the kids would call slick. Don't be slick. Because the government will come and we'll see about it. We'll find out about it. Oh, we'll find out about it. We have our ways. No, the Medicare marketing guidelines gives directions to plans, specific uh, and particular. We go into detail to plans regarding where available locations, uh, their marketing and sales events may or may not take place. So they're aware of these regulations in advance. All right. We didn't just tell them don't do this. We explained to them how and why. And that's all housed within the marketing guidelines that I mentioned to you earlier. OK, so the next slide, uh, licensure, appointment and termination of agents and sales brokers. Super important, by the way. So you're going to see two boxes appear on the screen. Um, and the reason why we have to talk about this is because you can't just have anybody marketing to our Medicare beneficiaries. Health and drug plans that conduct marketing utilizing agents, brokers, and other marketing reps or representatives must comply with state licensure. Remember I mentioned the state earlier, they're an active partner with making sure that compliance is in place, enforcing compliance. And appointment laws to give the state information about which agents are marketing Medicare Advantage plans and drug plans. Health and drug plans must report the termination of any agent and broker and the reasons for their termination to the state or states, their license in various states if required. 
you know, by, they sometimes and oftentimes report it to us as well. In addition, any quote unquote four cause terminations, specific legal or organizational policy violations um, that may have made it necessary to terminate um, a particular agent or broker must be reported to the CMS account manager, somebody like yours truly, either by email or by letter. Why? Because we need to now track and make sure that that person has not adversely impact other members or we not, did not receive complaints coming in from 1-800-MEDICARE more than once regarding that same sales broker, agent broker. That person could also be working for other plans too. So we wanna make sure that this person doesn't get away with misleading our beneficiaries. Next, we're going to discuss um, their training and testing for agent brokers. They all have to be tested and they all have to be trained annually. Okay, and this would be based on our, our rules and regulations, similar to what I'm sharing with you this afternoon, as well as plan specific detail. Why? Because if you're going to sit down and try to procure uh, a customer, you're going to need to be uh, familiar with the benefits that you are discussing and be able to reasonably address any questions that might come up. So you got to know your product, <laughs> right? They have to pass the test. So we don't, we don't just require the plans, train them. They have to test them. Like we do kind of sort of here with the knowledge checks, all right? But instead they have to have a score and it has to be 85% or higher before um, marketing any products. So for you all, it's easy. We're just having fun with you, but for them, it's serious business and it could be a matter of employment or not. They have to ensure that uh, the agents and brokers, the plans that is, have to ensure that these agents and brokers uh, selling their products are trained and tested annually, pass the test, and then they can let them market. All right, so I just wanted to reiterate that. We're moving on now. Rewards and incentives. Remember, I mentioned that I was going to cover this in further detail. So Medicare Advantage plans may include information about rewards and incentive programs in marketing materials for their potential members, right? Marketing of rewards and incentive programs, however, must do two things. Number one, this is the no, will be read with an X, not be used in exchange for enrollment. I mentioned that earlier. Number two, be provided to all potential members without discrimination. Remember, I mentioned this earlier. That's another red circle with an X, so no go. Nominal gifts that are a part of marketing activity are different from rewards and incentives. Bet you didn't know that. Medicare drug plans actually aren't permitted by 42 CFR section 422.134 to develop or even use rewards and incentive programs. They don't have to do it. Therefore, Part D plans may not market reward and incentive programs. They're not permitted to do it. For additional information, you're welcome to review our Medicare Managed Care Manual under chapter four for additional information. Again, you will find this information in the appendices under downloads. Okay, just a couple of resources you wanna share. We've kind of talked a little bit about this earlier today, uh, but the first one here under the first uh, row, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Well, you know, that's us. Um, again, if you're looking for some information, just general knowledge on the Medicare program, reporting, marketing misrepresentations, or you have concerns about an SCP that you're looking at, you can always call 1-800-MEDICARE. We also have the two websites, Medicare.gov, which has the Medicare plan finder, and you can do um, information like coverage determinations, uh, get an understanding of what is covered by Medicare through Medicare.gov. If you're looking for technical manual information, like the Medicare Advantage manual, um, you want to look at the CFR, that's on cms.gov. So again, easy to read language information is on medicare.gov. Technical manual is on cms.gov. To get uh, the list of the marketing communications and marketing, um, I'm sorry, Medicare um, communications and marketing guidelines, Again, CMS has that information at cms.gov, and you can download the latest guideline PDF as well. Uh, the Medicare Managed Care Manual, so again, all the guidance that's given to Medicare Advantage plans is listed on the CMS website. Okay, two other great resources on this page I want to direct you to, of course, socialsecurity.gov if you have questions about Medicare enrollment 
Um, even when you're looking at filing the appeal or during the IRMA amount for prescription drug plans, um, that's on ssa.gov. You can learn more about that. And then, of course, the state health insurance assistance programs. We know that the ships are vital in the success of helping us get people enrolled into not only the Medicare program, understanding how Medicare works and working with Social Security and other partners, but also going through the Medicare plan finder, explaining uh, prescription drug coverage, explaining Medicare supplemental insurance and enrolling into Medicare prescription drug plans or Medicare Advantage plans with drug coverage. There's a ship in every state and typically they're with the Department of Insurance or they're with the Department on Aging in that state. So to get a list of the ships in your area, visit shiphelp.org, um, click on that website and it allows you to filter to, to learn about the ship in your state. The next slide is really gonna just direct you to some key resources you might wanna just download or be familiar with, or if you need to order products, these are wonderful. Of course, the first one uh, that you can order on medicare.gov slash publications. You do need to create um, some sort of uh, account if you're going through the product ordering at cmshhs.gov. That allows you to get multiple copies of a certain uh, product or a certain um, uh, publication, um, you'll have to register your organization. But let's look at the first one here. Medicare New Handbook. They come out every fall. Typically, if you're um, a partner in the in the aging population, you know that they do request uh, the bulk order of handbooks in early spring. Um, but again, the Medicare New Handbook is available also online, but you can order copies of that at medicare.gov. A couple of things also I want to point out. Have you done your yearly Medicare plan review? This is a nice tool in anticipation of the Medicare open enrollment season. It allows you to kind of get some key questions answered. Um, what are, are there any changes in your health care? Have um, your current health insurance changed? Is this why you're looking at either joining a Medicare prescription drug plan with Medicare Advantage or if you're looking to make changes? Understanding Medicare Advantage and the Medicare drug plan enrollment periods. This is a great product to have, um, especially since we talked about the five key uh, open enrollment seasons, SEPs, and initial enrollment periods. This kind of outlines that product. Uh, understanding Medicare Advantage plans provider network. This explains a little bit about how they develop the, the uh, network, making sure that's an adequate network of providers, hospitals, and doctors in either your state, your county, your service area, and then kind of go about looking at the appeals process as well. And lastly, the understanding Medicare Advantage plans. That's a nice publication. It explains what each of the different products are, like the HMOs, the PPOs, uh, private fee for service plans, or even the special needs plans. So again, to order this, if you're a partner, you can visit productordering.cms.hhs.gov for bulk orders or multiple copies of different publications. Um, but you can also order just a single one on medicare.gov slash publications and just enter either keyword or product number. All right, Melissa. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm back, everyone. I promised you I would cover some portions of the appendix and we're going to look at appendix A in front of you. Uh, this is a comparison of Medicare Advantage plans and Sylvia did a fantastic job on providing an overview of each of these plans. Um, and this particular slide will let you know if these plans, basic information about if they charge a monthly premium. And you want to know that because you want to know make uh, budgetary, if you will, preparation uh, as you select or some, uh, you're helping someone to select a plan. Okay, so if you want information additional about this, uh, as Sylvia mentioned, you can go on to our uh, Medicare.gov website. And the publication you would select would be Understanding Medicare Advantage Plans, okay, as she just mentioned. Okay, and so now we're going to move on. And in addition to Medicare Advantage, we're talking about Part C, Providers. Okay, so you want to know if a person or if yourself or someone you're assisting can use any doctor or hospital that accepts Medicare for covered services. In particular, uh, if you're under fee for service, right? But if you're under the HMO sometimes, and you would basically use their provider network. Um, provider pre Preferred provider organizations allows you to go out of network. So you want to figure out from them if it's acceptable, the answer is yes. Uh, private fee for service, absolutely yes, because it's fee for service. 
Um, special needs plans sometimes, but because of the level of care that they offer to high risk patients, it's probably better to stay in network. And then the Medicare savings account is not an actual plan, it's an account. So yes, you would have to seek coverage uh, under original uh, Medicare for providers that offer original Medicare services. Okay, so this is Appendix A. If you wanted information about this particular topic, uh, you can um, download the publication that Sylvia just covered. Um, it should be in the Medicare Understanding of Medicare Advantage Plans um, booklet. Um, you also want to know whether the plans offer drug coverage or not, because you need to know where to get access to your medication coverage. Um, I'm not seeing that on the slide in front of me. Um, okay, let's stop here for a second. I'm jumping the gun. Do you need a referral from a doctor to see a specialist? Why is this important? Because if you need to see a specialist, you don't. You want to minimize the time that you have to wait in order to make your appointment. So you know for a fact that HMOs are in their work only and they require a referral. Most HMOs do. So the answer is yes there. However, the other plan designs do not require a referral because you can go in and out of network and private fee for service is not an issue because it's fee for service. Um, special needs sometimes, but because the members tend to be high risk, the doctors and the other medical professionals tend to work closely together to make sure that that process is as, as streamlined as possible because of the person's con condition. And in medical savings accounts, no, because it's not an actual plan. Okay. Now you want to determine um, the differences between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Again, Sylvia did a phenomenal job in discussing this earlier throughout the presentation. However, um, if you wanted to take a look at that, this is a way that you can kind of, this gives you a way to kind of think about the coverage, both under fee-for-service and under Part C. Believe it or not, some people don't want uh, Medicare Advantage. They don't want to be told what to do and how to obtain their care. So they stay under fee-for-service. Um, that may or may not be some of you one day. I don't know, but we have the information available. We try to kind of meet everyone's needs in the best way possible. Um, so this will be a way that you can kind of, um, I guess, make a different differentiation uh, as you do your cost benefit analysis. Next up, we have underneath um, coverage, we have original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage cost. This is a particularly important slide. I'm sure you all will agree because you want to know what your what your cost will be and how that's going to impact your budget ultimately, right? So this is where your cost benefit analysis work comes into play even more so, because you wanna know what you're going to be spending in any given year for your coverage. So if you or someone that you're assisting with obtaining uh, access to, to reasonable coverage, um, this would be a good slide or good information for you to sit down with and read about and kind of compare, if you will. Uh, we always uh, make these types of recommendations uh, as we go out and conduct trainings. That way you're as wise as possible about your healthcare choice. The next slide um, continues with coverage, what it covers and what it's not and how to obtain, uh, obtain access to different coverage, particularly Part B. Medicare Advantage typically offers Part B coverage. Original Medicare, you have to select your own Part B plan. If you don't want to have to do that, then you would join, make it convenient for yourself and join a plan that already offers that and has done the footwork for you. Uh, your only concern would be cost and then your providers and your pharmacists and so forth and your medication being available under that particular, under the particular Medicare Advantage plan that you're interested in. Okay, this information can also be found in that same publication referenced earlier, Understanding Medicare Advantage Plans. And then also travel, big one because we have a lot of people who are what are called snowbirds. They live in one part of the country during a certain time of the year, probably when it's nice and warm, and then they move to another part of the country when it gets cold so that they can continue being warm. All right, so we understand that. So we have a slide here that addresses that. If you're traveling here or you're traveling outside of the United States, you're gonna to need to know what's gonna happen with your coverage. Maybe you live, live here and then you live in France, uh, a few few months out of the year, fine. 
What are you going to do with your coverage if that is your circumstance? Because we do not cover care outside of the United States and very few, if any, Part C, Part C Medicare Advantage plans cover them. Okay, some may cover what is called what are called supplemental benefits for emergencies and urgently needed care. But I have to tell you, coming to CMS from a private health plan, there are strict rules for that. For instance, you have to call in within 24 hours to let them know when there's an emergency or an urgent care situation, or you might not be covered. So it's good to, again, conduct the comparison and based on your particular circumstance and then make a reasonable choice based on your coverage. Okay, and I think we rounded it out now. Uh, Melissa, because we're going to continue with the acronyms. This is the final page of that. And then we have Q&A. So I will turn it back to Melissa. I want to thank you all for your time and participation and for allowing me the privilege to speak to you today about Medicare. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much, Kelly. We appreciate um, that wonderful explanation, walking us through plan marketing and resources and ways to compare benefits and costs and all the things that are really important when people are thinking about comparing original Medicare to Medicare Advantage and they struggle with what's the difference between Medicare Advantage and Medigap. There's a lot of information in today's presentation. So with that, this concludes today's workshop. And I really wanna thank all of our presenters, Sylvia Gary and Kelly Singleton, uh, for a great walkthrough of the content, as well as our subject matter experts, Teresa Zayas and Melissa Flores, who are working hard to respond to your questions during the presentation through that Q&A. Remember, you can download the slides and materials from our website at the same place that you launched this course. And finally, as I've stated before, you can email us at training at cms.hhs.gov. Thank you to everyone who attended today, and thanks to everyone who has attended some or all of our other NTP virtual workshops this year. We look forward to receiving your evaluation so we can start planning the 2024 NTP workshops. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.